On February 8, 1977, the Air Force's new A-10 attack aircraft was tested at a small airfield near Gila Bend, Arizona. The Air Force Test and Evaluation Center, AFTEC, which conducted the operation, and Tactical Air Command, TAC, which flies the plane, were trying to find answers to questions about the A-10's performance and its people. For example, how effectively could the plane do its job? Fly a maximum number of missions in a minimum amount of time, getting its weapons on target when and where needed. And could the ground crews do their job? Prepare the A-10 for combat quickly, repeat that process many times in one day in a surge of activity, and do it at a remote, austere base as in wartime. In finding answers to these questions, Air Force hoped to find answers to others equally as important. For instance, how dependable is the plane? Can it take punishment without breaking down? Can it be serviced, armed, fueled in minimum time? Can you launch it, recover it, and start all over again? And what about the ground crews? Can they work on it efficiently, safely, over an extended period, turning the aircraft around and getting it ready to fly? Before we look at this test of the plane's ability to surge and find some of those answers, let's talk a bit about the A-10 itself, what it is and what it does, so you can get a deeper appreciation of its capabilities and their significance. The A-10 is the first aircraft in Air Force history designed and built for the sole purpose of supporting the Army combat soldier. This close air support role is a demanding one. To do the job, you must be able to carry heavy loads, sometimes great distances. And when you get where you're going, stay there a long time, finding your targets and hitting them and coming back, reloading and doing it all over again. Simply put, it means being responsive to the needs of the soldier on the ground. It also means that you're far more vulnerable to enemy attack from small arms fire as well as anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missiles. So survivability, along with staying power, maneuverability, and load carrying, are some of the attributes we look for in a good close air support aircraft. Simplicity of design and maintenance is also needed. Operating close to the front lines near the troops limits availability of maintenance people and equipment. So the plane should be relatively easy to service and keep flying. The A-10 is, and a lot more. It's a big airplane with large wings that not only make it more maneuverable and stable at slow speeds, but give it more room to hang more bombs and rockets, up to 16,000 pounds. But it's the gun that packs the A-10's biggest punch. The GAU-8 Gatling is the biggest, most accurate weapon ever fired from a fighter aircraft. It's a tank killer that can destroy the other side's biggest piece of operational armor in a single short burst. And in Europe, where communist bloc tanks outnumber NATO armor by more than two to one, it should be especially welcome and effective. Another weapon that will increase the A-10's tank killing capability is the imaging infrared Maverick missile, called the Double IR for short. And while it wasn't used during the surge test, it is programmed to be an important part of the total A-10 weapon system. So a brief look at how the two will work together would be appropriate. The Double IR is an air-to-surface missile that can literally see in the dark and that makes it ideally suited for night use and in the marginal weather common to Central and Eastern Europe. Instead of using visible light to see its target, it uses the heat generated by that target to build a television picture. This enables the pilot to pinpoint enemy armor on a small TV screen even when there's little or no light and to strike those targets dead center with an improbably high proportion of direct hits. Mated to an A-10 that can maneuver easily under clouds only 100 feet above ground, it will help deny the enemy the protective cover of night or the weather. Both the plane and the missile have already worked together successfully as a team in tests conducted at England Air Force Base and Fort Polk in Louisiana. In those tests, Army tanks were used to simulate communist bloc armor and in an attempt to defeat the aircraft were deployed on a battlefield masked in dense smoke and haze and where fires were lit to try to lure the heat-sensitive Maverick from its targets. Despite these obstacles, and in many missions flown at night, the A-10 double IR team still did its job. The aircraft, using the missile's TV picture, found its target time after time in a long series of simulated attacks. But to fight, it must survive. And the aircraft has a great deal of survivability built into it. There's a titanium armor plate shield to protect the pilot and the flight control system. Self-sealing fuel tanks and enough redundancy or backup systems to make survival more a matter of planning than chance. Its twin engines, too, are part of the survival package, 
cool exhausts reduce the risk of a heat-seeking missile finding its mark. And the engines are widely separated, so the probability of both being destroyed is lessened. Of course, your chances for surviving an air battle depend as much on how you fly as they do on what you fly. With that in mind, much of the A-10's effectiveness in its close air support role will result directly from the work performed by a small group of TAC pilots in February 1977. Their job was to find out how the aircraft could be used to best advantage in combat. That's a complex task, a difficult balancing act that weighs the flying characteristics of the plane and the weapons it carries against the kind of targets to be hit and how well defended they are. In some respects, it's a series of trade-offs as you try to get maximum ordnance on target as accurately as you can while exposing yourself as little as possible to enemy fire. In developing these tactics for the A-10, the pilots doing the job found the plane's ability to work close to the ground was exposing it to far less ground fire than anticipated. In other words, it could approach its target low level, pop up briefly to get it in its sights, fire, then either re-attack or move out quickly, again at low level, and all before enemy gunners could get an accurate fix. To show you the problems involved in trying to track the A-10 from the ground, here's what the aircraft would look like in the sights of an enemy gunner. In order for this gun to register hits, the plane must be in the exact center of the reticle for a number of seconds so that the gun's radar can get accurate tracking information. As you can see, that's difficult to do. And the A-10's maneuverability, its low-level flying capability, and the tactics developed during this exercise won't make it any easier. Countering the air threat was another challenge met by the TAC pilots. In addition to taking full advantage of the plane's amazing agility to frustrate faster but far less agile attackers, they also developed a method for engaging enemy aircraft without having to release the ordnance they carry under their wings. That's an important capability when you remember that the A-10's mission is close air support, not air superiority, and that those bombs and missiles need to be carried to their targets not jettisoned to allow the plane a bit more maneuverability. Now that you have a clearer picture of what a close air support aircraft like the A-10 is expected to do, let's look at the February 8th surge test, how it was conducted and some of the results. A small auxiliary airfield near Tucson was chosen as test site for several reasons. Gila Bend is an emergency recovery site for fighters flying its weapons delivery practice range, and it serves as home base for the men and women who maintain that range. So as far as flight facilities are concerned, it's fairly bare bones. In this respect, it resembles the kind of front-line airfields from which the A-10 would normally operate in wartime. And this part of the country almost always enjoys favorable flying weather. Finally, the field is only 120 miles west of davis Monthan Air Force Base, where both the AFTEC test team and the A-10's 355th Tactical Fighter Wing are assigned. The test force included three A-10s. One would serve as backup, but as it turned out, was never needed. Eight pilots from both AFTEC and the 355th would crew the planes, each flying three sorties. A sortie is one flight by one plane. 35 support personnel from davis Monthan would keep them flying. Munitions maintenance people, weapons loaders, and aircraft maintenance specialists. Fuel specialists tasked to refuel the planes as quickly and safely as possible would come from Luke Air Force Base, also in Arizona. On February 4th, Eight munitions men and 140 inert or practice bombs moved to Gila Bend. The remainder, including the people, planes, and other equipment, moved into position on the 7th, the day before the test. Takeoff for the first of 17 two-plane missions took place on schedule shortly before dawn on the 8th. This put the A-10s over their target, a mock armored column some 60 nautical miles away, just as first light broke over the rugged hills that surround the range. Coming onto the target, each of the planes was loaded with four 500-pound bombs and 1,000 rounds of 30-millimeter ammunition. They made three passes over the column, dropping the bombs on the first run, then using the A-10's quick turning ability to re-attack two more times, this time firing about 200 rounds from the big gun. These tactics would remain essentially unchanged throughout the test. Four bombs would be uploaded after each mission, and the gun would take on an additional 800 rounds at the midpoint of the operation. The first indication that both people and aircraft would perform far beyond expectation was a quick check of wristwatches as the planes broke ground for their second mission of the day. Planners had predicted it would take 55 minutes for the aircraft to take off, fly to their target, attack it several times, return to the field, rearm, and take off again. Well, it didn't take 55 minutes, it took only 40. 
And while that 15 minute savings doesn't sound like very much, multiply it by the 34 sorties actually flown. You discover that if sufficient fuels and ordnance had been available, each of the planes could have been over its target at least four more times. Eight additional sorties for a two plane total of 42 in one dawn to dusk cycle. To the GI on the ground, those additional missions could very well spell the difference between life and death. The aircraft would land, taxi back to the spot. We would turn him, which would be uh, OMS would do an inspection of the aircraft, make sure it was airworthy. MMS would load uh, munitions on board the aircraft. We'd send him back out, and it'd take eight minutes from the time he touched the ramp until the time he was taken off from the, uh, the runway again. And uh, that makes the Army real happy because we're out there to support the Army. And the faster we can get the plane on target, the more it can do for the Army. The test techniques used to quickly turn the planes around were similar to those developed for wartime use. Peacetime procedures are somewhat more conservative and take longer simply because the urgency isn't there. But both AFTEC and TAC needed to know the A-10's peak wartime sortie generation rate. That is, how quickly and how often you can get your planes off the ground and over their targets when the pressure's on. We had an idea that the aircraft could be loaded at a fast rate of time. But I think we really proved that you can really load this aircraft in minimal amount of time that's necessary. Now here's how the test team did it. Two munitions load crews were assigned to each aircraft. They did their loading in the maintenance area while the planes were being serviced, rather than moving them to a separate bomb loading point after completion of normal maintenance. And engines were left turning during the loading process. This not only saved time, but also reduced the potential for engine problems. It was about the time that you uh, stopped the aircraft and went through your post-light checks, your post-light armament checks with the engines running. The weapons crew were already uh, uploading your bombs and uh, you were already thinking about planning your next sortie. The planes, their air and ground crews performed so smoothly that the original schedule of a new pilot and fuel every three missions was changed to every four missions shortly after the test began. Reduced ground time and the A-10's thrifty gas habits also played their part. Reloading the gun, which was scheduled to follow the eighth mission, was also slipped to the ninth. We asked several pilots how many times they thought an A-10 aircraft could fly in a single day, and I got answers anywhere from four to 12 times. It's almost inconceivable that an airplane could keep flying after 17 times in a single day. Uh, this was particularly impressive to me as a pilot. Turnaround times were truly remarkable. Average ground time when only bombs were uploaded was less than 11 minutes less than 20 minutes when both fueling and arming were required. And the big gun was loaded with 800 rounds in fewer than 16 minutes, even though the crews used a manual method rather than a semi-automated system which will soon be available. But just as remarkable as the performance of the people who flew and maintained the A-10s was the dependable performance of the planes themselves. From sunrise to sunset, each flew 17 missions identical to the type they'd fly in wartime. In one day, they flew a combined total of more than 4,000 miles, dropped 70,000 pounds of bombs, and fired more than 3,600 rounds from their Gatling guns. Yet during all of this flying and fighting, the aircraft accumulated a combined total of only three minor maintenance write-ups, none of which was serious enough to interfere with either the performance of the mission or the safety of the crews. The A-10 performed amazingly well during the surge. As the day unfolded and the aircraft sorties kept going one after the other. Each time you kind of expected something to go wrong, something to break down. As the day wore on, it finally became apparent that nothing was going to break down. We had the feeling the A-10s could have flown all week long if they'd have had to and kept on flying. On February 8, 1977, at Gila Bend, Arizona, the A-10 showed that it could give the ground commander the support he needs, effectively, responsibly. Operating from an austere frontline airfield, it dramatically demonstrated what good, close air support is all about. <laughs>